I can think of no better role model, doctor, researcher, entrepreneur, and person to address you today. Please extend the warmest welcome to Professor Shannon to the podium. Thank you very much. President, uh, Professor O'Halloran, members of faculty, graduates of 2018, and ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to everyone. This is a special day. This is a magical day, you might say. And you will be fortunate if at the end of your career you can remember or count even on one hand five magical days in your life. I can remember my graduation day. Uh, but other than my marriage, the birth of my children, the conferring, I'd struggle to name many more special days. Maybe going to Thurman Park with my children to watch Munster win the miracle match might qualify. But I can tell you, 40th and 50th birthdays don't cut it. Uh, so this is a special day. This is your day. It's a day for celebration. It's also a day for reflection. Graduations are wonderful uh, events, and I congratulate all of you, but I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to think about where do you go next? Because it doesn't end here. This is really only the beginning. And in James Joyce's wonderful story of Ulysses, Leopold Bloom wanders around a city on a Dublin day a hundred years ago. And during the course of that day, he actually punctures a lot of medical egos. He heaps scorn, actually, on medical students and doctors. And he reflects on the contribution of medicine to society. Now, he does much more than that, but the medical aspects are marvelous. And in the course of that day, he actually wanders into the National Maternity Hospital, where I trained, in Dublin. He goes there to visit a mother who's been in labor for three days. And he observes the medical students. And he thinks about how raucous they are. And he thinks about the contrast between someone in labor for three days and how frivolous and raucous they are. And he thinks to himself, <coughs> How can it be that the mere acquisition of a title, the conferral of a parchment, much like happened there now, changes these frivolous students into pillars of society? And so it will be with you all. It'll never be the same again. You're now doctors. And of course you will celebrate and should celebrate, and you will be otherwise unchanged, but society will expect a lot of you. You will now be hugely privileged and honored to be part of people's stories, their lives. And most of them will be in crisis. For you, it'll be routine. For them, it'll be crisis. And they will expect something of you. So your attitude to them and to society will have to involve your own self-reflection and consideration about what kind of doctor you are. In my case, I owe it to my mother. I didn't do medicine for all the reasons people usually give. I didn't question her. I did medicine because she told me to do it. <laughs> and she was right. Mothers are always right. Everyone knows that, right? But the real question now is not why you became a doctor. The real question for you now is, what kind of doctor are you going to be? And I'm not referring to the specialty you might choose. I'm talking about what kind of style you will have as a doctor. And will you build on the learning you've had here? Will you be self-reflective? Will you be self-critical? Will you be continually calibrating yourself to properly serve your patients? And I never saw it qu expressed quite as accurately as when Robert Brooke wrote an article in the Journal of the Mer Me American Medical Association. He was a colleague of mine at UCLA, and he wrote the title of an article as a mathematical formula and said, a physician equals emotion plus passion plus science. 
A physician equals emotion plus passion plus science. That was the title of the article. Science gives us a way of thinking. Science is what separates us from the quacks and the charlatans, but it isn't enough. You also need to invest emotion into what you do. Your patients require that if you're going to have any empathy for them. And you also must invest a passion into your work or else you'll quickly burn out. So how will you get through a career without burnout, without disenchantment or disillusionment? And how will you serve your patients? How will you remain fresh? Young doctors like you usually want to be good doctors, whereas older doctors want to be good people. I would ask you to consider the possibility that the old guys might be right on this one, and that if you strive to be a good person, there's a better than even chance you'll actually be a good doctor. Would it surprise you that not long ago, I wrote an article for the Royal College of Physicians of the United Kingdom, and I was asked to, speak, to write on medicine in changing times, but the title of the article I gave was, Who Needs Doctors? And I was referring to the number of doctors who've lost their way. The words we hear now from them are unfulfilled, unhappy, disillusioned, low morale, burnout. Many doctors have talked themselves out of a job and have reduced themselves to triage agents. Unnecessary, irrelevant, and actually replaceable. That's not what you want. That's not what you want to become. And I concluded in that article that doctors can stay fresh in changing times if they steadfastly uphold the scientific basis of medicine as a way of thinking, and if they adopt the medical humanities to deepen their understanding of what it feels like to be sick. And you won't get that from the textbooks you've had. We taught you a lot about disease. You'll need to invest yourself in other areas to know what, it likes, what it's like to be ill to use the illness words that patients care about. Words like caring, words like waiting, words like burden, words like shame, words like stigma, words like anger, and words like depression, and despair when someone is ill. And you will get that if you invest yourself in what some people call the medical humanities. I'd say it's just life. And you'll get that in literature, in history, and in narrative. And medicine will change beyond recognition in your career, in your lifetime. It changed immeasurably during my career. It'll change faster during yours. It will be enhanced and at the same time challenged by super specialization, molecular medicine, evidence-based everything, but particularly technology will change it, including computerization and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the traditional doctor-patient encounter may well actually be replaced by a patient versus the health system encounter. And you will be required to be the coach for the patient. You will be required to be their advocate, to be the one that helps them get through what is sometimes a very insensitive system. And how will you cope with those changes? You'll have to be a lifelong learner. The most important thing that I learned in medical school was how to learn. You will have to be self-reflective, self-questioning, and self-critical. And I've been trying to distill into one word what piece of advice I might give you to cover all those things. What single quality do you think might best predict a good doctor, might best describe a good doctor? And lots of words come to mind, but one stands out for me. Curiosity. And everything else follows from that. Curiosity should drive the entire medical enterprise and the open acknowledgement of our ignorance, our ignorance of nature, our ignorance of medicine, our ignorance of biology, and our uncertainty. You're launching on a career that is the science of uncertainty. The best way to care for your patients is to care about your patients. And the best way to care about your patients is to be interested in your patients and to be curious about them. And I think hu humans are remarkably curious entities. Some of you may remember Dr. Spock on Star Trek, who said to Captain Kirk, 
You humans, you're remarkably curious individuals. Who needs science fiction when you've got humans around? They are remarkably curious, and I'm as fascinated by the patients today at the end of my career as I was at the beginning of, the, of my career, and that's what kept me alive and fresh in a very challenging situation. Now, several authors have written on curiosity, and curiosity as an antidote to burnout in doctors. And one author, Timothy Gilligan, at Cleveland Clinic recalls a mentor dismissing him and dismissing his reasons for doing medicine as completely invalid, invalid and irrelevant and said, you should only become a doctor if you have a pathological fascination with humanity. A pathological fascination with humanity. The only thing, he said, the only thing that will keep you engaged will be to maintain endless interest in people. Now, the story I particularly like was told by Professor Faith Fitzgerald at the University of California. And with a name like Fitzgerald, she's probably one of ours from way back. But she told some lovely stories. She's now very elderly. But one particular story was an elderly physician who was her mentor who went down to the accident and emergency room, as you will do. And there was an individual there who was down and out, down in his luck, and ill-kempt, probably malnourished, probably addicted to something, and, but nothing specific wrong. And the health service officials wanted to just have him discharged, send him home. And this clinician said, no, admit him. To which everyone said, but, Professor, what are we admitting him for? They challenged him. And he said, we're admitting him for compassion. And compassion is good enough. That's a good enough reason to admit anyone to hospital, to try and take stock of the situation and see what you can do to improve his welfare. That's good enough. And remember that next year when you're challenged in the same kind of way. But Professor Fitzgerald's story was actually even more interesting than that because she was trying to teach the medical students and the young graduates like you she was trying to teach them that there are no uninteresting patients. There is nobody who's not interesting in their own way. And she brought them on ward rounds and she asked the chief resident, identify for me the least interesting patient on the ward. And they were thinking about someone with cardiac murmurs and pneumonia and bronchial breathing and all sorts of interesting things. And she said, no, no, I want the most, most uninteresting, the least interesting patient you can think of. And they protested and protested, but they brought her along to a woman, an elderly woman who was only admitted because she'd been abandoned and she was old. And she had no one in the world to look after her. You'll have patients like that. We've lots of those patients coming into the A&E. You'll have them. And Professor Fitzgerald started to take the history. And for a while it was looking like this woman probably was really uninteresting. She had been a maid all her life in a hostel and had nothing interesting to say about her life experiences. But the professor persisted and said, how long have you lived in San Francisco? Years and years, was the reply. Were you here for the 1906 earthquake? No, I came after that. Where did you come from? Ireland. When did you come? 1912. Have you ever been in hospital before? Once when I broke my arm. How did that happen? A trunk fell on it. What kind of trunk? A steamer trunk. How did that happen? The boat lurched. What boat? The boat that was carrying me to America. Why did the boat lurch? It hit an iceberg. Oh. What was the name of the boat? And you all know the name of the boat. Well now, who's the most uninteresting patient in the hospital now? And then there were TV crews all there to see a survivor <laughs> from the Titanic. So, don't let time constraints erode your curiosity in patients. Not only will the care of your patients be enhanced, but your life will be enriched by your interest in patients. Caring for people actually is regenerative, and as bad as things seem at times, and as, a, as awful as the health service may be at times, 
You can actually do well if you do well by your own patients and if you remain curious in them and you stick to your, stick to your job and find interest in the ordinary because it's never ordinary really. And I've loved medicine as an art and as a science, but I've particularly enjoyed the science of the art. And hard work and more than a little luck helped me along the way. Other than my mother's advice, I think I listened to others, but proceeded to ignore most of the advice I was ever given about my career. But I didn't ignore everything, uh, so why should I give you any advice? Because I didn't actually ignore everything. And the following words, I think, summarize the sentiment I want to express. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I? I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference, Robert Frost. Now, it probably doesn't matter which road you take and which fork you take. It probably doesn't matter a whole lot at all. It'll be your attitude that'll determine everything. But that poem is usually taken as an assertion of individualism. And you might say it is an affirmation of the importance of following one's instinct rather than always following the crowd and maintaining the status quo. And you might say, can individuals actually make a difference? I would put it to you that individuals are the only thing that makes a difference in society and in a health service and in a bureaucracy. And I detest the word, the term, the phrase, status quo. I plead with you to be ambitious and don't settle for the status quo. Only bureaucracy strives to maintain the status quo. But can individuals make a difference? Yes, you can. And if we always do the same, we'll always have the same. When I was in secondary school, I can recall one of my teachers telling us repeatedly, reciting Alexander Pope on the following lines about the idea of doing something new for the first time. Be not the first by whom the new are tried, nor the last to lay the old aside. I never liked those words. I always found them to be hopelessly conservative and lacking any encouragement to take initiative and be the first. And so I repeat, what we need is a new generation of risk takers, those who dare to be different, who dare to follow their instincts. The progress and future of this society, this health service, all societies, needs people like you, needs you. Because only you can actually make a difference and change things. So for me, a risk taker is someone who sees opportunity and willing to take a chance and risk failure, knowing that it's a calculated risk, you're not going to fail at all. When Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, completed 10,000 experiments with a storage battery that failed to reduce, produce any results, he said, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. But I prefer Samuel Beckett's injunction, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. Life's so-called failures lead to success if we're brave enough to learn from them. And in a different context, a great American president, Teddy Roosevelt, said the following, far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. And so success will come to you. It'll come in different forms, and it won't be easy to measure, and it won't be obvious to others. But it will usually be related to how you influence others, including your children. For me, the simplest, most comprehensive definition of success came from a basketball coach, John Wooden. Success is the peace of mind, the simple satisfaction in knowing you did your best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. I would like to conclude by congratulating every one of you and your families and a final good wish to the graduates of 2018. 20 years from now, you will regret more the things that you did not do than the things you did do. 20 years from now, you will regret more the things you did not do than the things you did do. In your career, in your life, in your interactions with others, in the opportunities that life will bring you, but most particularly 
in your interactions with your patients. Don't leave any loopholes for regret. Thank you for your attention.